Oh, good morning. Um, it is way too early to stand, but thank you for the warm welcome. Um, I hope that you all enjoyed last night's opening plenary session as much as I did. And I certainly hope that you had a lot of fun afterwards. And I'm just so thrilled that so many of you are here relatively early in the morning. Um, before we get started with our panel this morning in an area that is one of deep passion for me, how do we do a better job of helping to celebrate people who have the courage to be second, who take an idea that someone else pioneered and figure out how to adapt it to their own communities or their own country's idiosyncrasies? Or how do we do a better job of celebrating people who are engaged in partnerships from the beginning of their project? Um, I want to talk first briefly and celebrate two CGIU 2014 commitment makers who really embody this ethos. So first I'd like to invite to stage Catherine Motika of the Technological Institute of Santo Domingo. Unfortunately, as I'm sure many of you are all too aware, the devastating effects of the 2010 earthquake in Haiti continue to be devastating for far too many people, particularly those who continue to live in refugee camps, camps that were set up to last for possibly six months that still now, more than four years later, tens of thousands of Haitians are living in. These camps are unsanitary and they're unsafe particularly for women and children who are at a higher risk of being sexually assaulted. And so Catherine and her teammate Anuar, who unfortunately is not here with us today, have teamed up with Colectivo Raybark Foundation to build extreme weather resistant homes made of recycled plastic bottles, sort of like the ones we just saw in the video, for approximately 200 displaced families in Le Palm, Haiti, ensuring that families can get out of the camps where they're living and hopefully never have to go back. Over the next couple of years, she and her team will collect more than 700,000 plastic bottles from Haitian schools, colleges, and businesses. And then with the support of crowdsourced funds, work with mechanical and electrical engineering students from her university and elsewhere, who will volunteer to build 50 permanent homes each, designed to fit a family of four, and to ensure that the Haitians who will live in those homes are part of their construction so that they know then how to help take care of them, repair them, and maintain them. The Colectivo Raybark Foundation initially used this recycling model to construct homes in the Dominican Republic for about $1,000 US dollars per home, far cheaper than the average cost of building in the Dominican Republic of $24,000 US dollars per home. Understanding the success and strength and affordability of these homes, as well as clearly the demand for housing in Haiti, this group will adapt the Raybark Foundation's model for Haitian needs. Please give her and her absent team members and all of those who clearly will help her achieve her vision a big round of applause. Second, I'd like to invite to stage Gavin Armstrong of the University of Guelph. Clearly, Gavin already has his own cheering section. Um, according to the World Health Organization, iron deficiency is the most pervasive nutritional deficiency in both the developed and the developing worlds. It causes birth defects, fatigue, memory loss, and clearly anemia. Particularly in the developing world, iron supplements are far too expensive and often not sufficiently wide enough distributed to enable families to protect themselves against iron deficiency. Women of reproductive age are particularly impacted by iron deficiency, as are their children. In Cambodia, the country's most recent demographic and health survey from 2010 reported that more than 40% of the country's population was iron deficient. Gavin, when he learned about this challenge, decided to scale an already proven solution instead of inventing his own 
by teaming up with Dr. Chris Charles and commercializing his simple solution, aptly named Lucky Iron Fish. Do you have one in your, oh good, I was hoping you had one. There it is. Um, as you can see, it's shaped like a fish. It's palm sized, but what may not be so apparent is that this lasts five years and that when cooked with food, it provides about 75% of someone's daily needs for iron. It's also an affordable solution. It's $5 for one fish for five years. Gavin's planning on manufacturing these fish locally so that not only are they a solution to iron deficiency, but they also help people learn skills, become economically empowered, and have jobs that hopefully last well into the future. Dr. Chris Charles, who invented the Lucky Iron Fish, first tested the product through two trial studies in rural Cambodia. His results showed that using the fish every day for nine months significantly increased circulation and restored levels of iron in women and reduced overall in the population of those tested iron deficiency by more than 50%. Gavin has already raised more than $1.3 million for his work. And he hopes to sell 10,000 lucky iron fish in the rural Kandal province of Cambodia by the end of 2014. Please give Gavin another round of applause. So now I'd like to invite to the stage our panelists for this morning's panel. Coming in second, Scaling What Works. Rosario Perez, President and CEO of Pro Mujer. <laughs> Bill Drayton, CEO of Ashoka. <laughs> Katie Smith Milway, Partner and Head of Knowledge, the Bridgespan Group. And Deo Nizonkiza, founder and CEO of Village Health Works. Well, given all of the applause that you each received, it sounds like at least some of the students know what each of your organizations does. Um, but I'll ask you before you answer um, the first question to please explain a little bit about what each of your organizations um, focuses on. Dale, I'm gonna start with you because you're to my left. Um, and, oh, please, yeah, to tell us about Village Health Works and then I'll ask you a question. Uh, um, Village Health Works is a, a health organization and it's a grassroots organization that is so embraced and owned by the community. We also have education program and uh, agriculture programs and economic development programs. And we work in a country called Burundi. Oh. And right in the front row, I'm sure that's not an accident. Um, and so Dea, when you, when you started Village Health Works, which as your brief description implies, does so much more than just focus on people's health. Um, I know that you first worked with Dr. Paul Farmer in Rwanda and really um, kind of learned from the Partners in Health model. So could you talk a little bit about sort of what you decided to take from Partners in Health in starting Village Health Works and what also you added that you knew needed to be done for the local context in Burundi that maybe wasn't part of Partners in Health model? Uh, thank you. Uh, there is a lot that uh, I have learned from uh, the work that Partners in Health has been uh, doing in different countries. Uh, I worked at Partners in Health in the, when uh, Partners in Health was still, was in, on, only in Haiti, not in Africa. Uh, I was very interested uh, by people who were working with the uh, with the patients who had no access to care, who were so marginalized. And that resonated uh, 
uh, because the, the conditions that I heard uh, from Dr. Paul Farmer in Haiti were similar to the conditions I was born and grew up in. So to just watch and participate and to see what uh, uh, Partners in Health uh, was doing, Community Health Worker Model, which uh, is uh, a fantastic model that uh, uh, every organization that is dealing with not just the health, but, uh, but education and others should uh, really be uh, used, replicated. So Village Health Works is a lot of community health workers trained by Partners in Health. Uh, but uh, we started uh, with the, the community members on a land donated by the community. And you, you learn something from, uh, uh, from uh, friends, from an organization, and uh, see what works where you are. And it's so important uh, for, for Village Earthworks, it was very important for Village Earthworks, being in a country that is a truly off the map today, a country called Burundi that has a similar history uh, to that of Rwanda, we had no other choice, we had no money. I approached community members who were dying in the hands of witchcraft doctors or in their homes or in ruined hospitals with no medication, no tools. And those are former enemies, uh, they call Hutus and Tutsis, but I must say uh, what happened between the Hutus and Tutsis was not just because of that, it was the result of the dehumanizing conditions that they were born in and grew up in. So <clears throat> here they are friends when they are in hospitals and when they are dying. I had one question. You are friends here. And you know that you have more in common that what has divided you. Is it possible to remain friends and build a health center on your own land? There was skepticism, suspicion before, but just that question was what started the spark of their own optimism and we started that way. So it's about the synergy, ideas, and look at what other people are doing and refine that and work on that. So partisan health has been so crucial in training our community health workers and the physicians, and uh, we, we are doing well. So I'm luck lucky and glad to. You are doing that. well, so thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Katie, please talk a little bit about um, Bridgeband and sort of how you help the NGOs and others that you work with sort of figure out where best to place themselves in this ecosystem of kind of wanting to make the world a healthier and better place. Um, and you know, one of the things that we were talking about briefly backstage is you know, you're one of the few people um, that I know of who's really thought and written about mergers and acquisitions in the nonprofit space you know, because there aren't the same financial inducements and incentives that exist in the for-profit space. Um, very rarely, um, do we hear of NGOs or foundations that have merged together where one has acquired another? So could you talk also a little bit about your work in that space? Um, and maybe you know, that would be useful to some of our students here as they think about kind of what their aspirations for how best to make an impact should look like. I'd love to. So the Bridgespan Group was founded 14 years ago. And we were founded um, with a mission to provide some vital infrastructure to the social sector um, around helping, I mean, sort of three pillars of, um, of effectiveness and impact. Uh, strategy, sound strategies, particularly for scaling. Um, directing, helping to influence funders toward things that worked, approaches that really worked. And then finally, develop leadership, because the best strategy in the world is, uh, is nothing without a good leader to execute on it. So we've really been working with clients directly um, across a gambit of fields, uh, gl global health, global development, um, education, and youth and families for 14 years. 
And, uh, and we really have seen during that time, we've watched our own um, theory of change evolve slightly to say, you know, it's not just helping these organizations become more effective, but also helping the systems and movements that they're a part of become more effective at the end of the day, breaking cycles of intergenerational poverty. So that's what we're really about. And we do it through some direct service to various organizations helping on those fronts I mentioned. And we also do it through the group that I lead, which is the Knowledge Group. And we collect sort of the most um, useful insights from our direct service and from other people's experience and, and create research projects that can help um, share freely uh, the best methods, et cetera, with, with any, any nonprofit or social leader uh, uh, globally. And we, so we, we do a lot of research and publishing that we give away. So one, you mentioned the mergers and acquisitions work, which I lead. Um, one of the, the questions we ask as we look at what are true platforms for scale is um, how can you think about that without addressing the massive fragmentation in the nonprofit sector? And so today, just in the U.S., there's about 40 nonprofits per zip code. I mean, it's just, it's a, and we were talking earlier in Burundi, just the plethora of nonprofits that spr spring up. You know, the 80-20 rule applies. 80% of them are very small, um, and 20% are the ones that actually are able to scale at some level and combine forces. So the, the work I've done is really looked at mergers and collaborations and, and has, looked at sort of helping folks think about what is the mission that they're trying to advance. And if you keep mission first, then where does organization fit in? And I, um, I, I have a little, a little mnemonic that I, I use to help social entrepreneurs. I'm, I'm actually a social entrepreneur too. I founded a small organization. So I, I ask myself these questions all the time as well. Um, but uh, you know, when you are starting something, should you be building? Or should you be lending your efforts to something that's already out there? Or should you be um, borrowing, borrowing someone else's platform? And so you're plugging in something that you're doing to an existing platform. So if you think about Charity Water, they are an amazing store for raising money for water. But they use World Vision on the back end to drill their wells. They use other platforms for scale. Their Kiva is another great example where they have brought in a lot of new donors to microfinance, but a lot of the loans that are on their site are being executed in the field by Opportunity International, World Vision, Pro Mujer, I'm sure is part of that. And so, so those are the kinds of questions you ask. And then if you have already founded an organization, this is where we get to the merger question, you, you need to ask yourself, do you invest or do you bequeath? Do you take what you have and look at another, you know, keep scanning the horizon. So I'll use my own organization as an example. It's called One Hen Inc. and it, it grew out of a a book I wrote, I write children's books on world issues as an avocation on uh, microfinance for kids and an, an educator movement grew up around it so we started to aggregate curriculum and then you know be very web-based, offer the resources globally um, but it's really about teaching late elementary and middle school kids financial literacy so enter the Khan Academy and they this year have just started a financial literacy curriculum they really started in math and sciences. So, I mean, the question we're asking at our board is, should we get an introduction to Saul Khan and see if we need to bequeath some of what we have if he wants to work with that age group? And so that we are sharing our resources on the very best platform possible. So those are the kinds of questions we really would call social entrepreneurs to ask. Well, I, I'm happy to introduce you to Saul Khan, if that's helpful. So I'll make that commitment to you. Um, Bill, could you talk a little bit about the Ashoka model and sort of how you think about the different levels of social change and sort of what your response would be to some of what Katie talked about. How do you help your kind of Ashoka network now, you know, thousands strong over the last 34 years, think about um, how best to invest or leverage their talents for impact? Well, I, I feel particularly close to this group because Ashoka got started when I was 19 and couldn't afford a trip, plane trip, trip to India, so we drove. And after several months in India of seeing the statistics of 100 to 1 per capita income difference become your friends and what that meant, the question was, well, what are you going to do about it? Well, sophomores, as you know, don't control a whole lot. So leverage is really important. And so what is the most powerful force in the world. It's always a pattern change idea, but only if it's in the hands of an entrepreneur. It's that combination 
that changes the world. Uh, so we can help more of that get started and succeed. So that's really the core of the Ashoka idea. And uh, there are 3,000 Ashoka fellows in 85 countries. Over half have changed national policy within five years. Three quarters the, the, the patterns in their field within five years. So indeed, it's very powerful. And many people here are going to be playing that sort of a life. But there's something more powerful, and this is, gets to what Katie and, uh, was beginning to discuss at the end. We're a community, and we help one another and collaborate together. And over the last 10 years, we've developed something called collaborative entrepreneurship, which is a huge breakthrough. It's a giant step beyond the solo entrepreneur. When we work together, 700 fellows focused on children and young people, you can really see the patterns. Each one is a piece of the pattern, but once you see the pattern, you can make your way to, where is this field really going? But you can't get from any one of the pieces. And then, how do we work together to actually tip the world? And in effect, what Katie was beginning to describe and what I've just been describing is the world moving to a very fluid, open team of teams architecture, which is completely, radically, not only different, but opposite from the old way of organizing. A few people choreograph everyone else and their vertical nervous systems and walls. So we're inventing how do we work together, uh, constantly changing combinations of teams because the world we're serving is always changing. That's very different. And so how do we develop those mechanisms? That's really, I think, where the great power is. And I really resonated to what you're doing. Um, Rosario, um, please talk a little bit about Pro Mujer, but also um, how the model has somewhat evolved from when Pro Mujer started in 1990. Um, because you, something I think that may not be as well known about Pro Mujer is similar to what Deo was talking about with Village Health Works, is that although you are a microfinance organization, you also provide um, real economic empowerment training, health services, you too are sort of much more than maybe kind of your snapshot implies. Yeah, uh, Promujer started, I, I can't take the credit for having founded Promujer. It was founded by two very, very courageous women, an American and a Bolivian. And it started in Bolivia and then it spread to Nicaragua and now we're in five countries in Latin America. And it started really as an education. Um, it, it, it started because at that time in El Alto, there was a lot of hunger and USAID was donating food. And uh, the, the, these two women, Carmen Velasco and Lynn Patterson decided, you know, we will distribute the food, but we want to do more than just distribute the food. So they went to the neighborhoods of El Alto, which is a, at that time was a very, very poor area. And uh, they brought this community uh, neighborhoods together to, you know, to get the donated food. And there were all these women who uh, really had never talked about themselves or, um, you know, nobody had really paid attention. They were pretty invisible. Um, and so they started with this, you know, teaching them, you know, uh, how to start a business, teaching them about themselves. and. Uh, and then after about eight months, the women came and said, you know, Senora Carmen and Senora Lynn, this is great, but we need to make a living. We need loans. So that's how the loan factor came in. And so Carmen and Lynn, who knew nothing about finance, uh, sort of started giving them loans from their own pocket. And I think uh, Lynn's uh, husband, uh, who was in, in um, you know, in the USAID or one of these organizations said, you can't do that. You have to, you know, there's programs that, and that's, they began to look at um, uh, a Grameen and um, other uh, models, and they chose the village model of banking because of the group. The group was very much at the core of what Promujer did. And now, and then later on, health came in because without health, 
basically, um, they're very vulnerable. And, uh, uh, but Promujer has a very strong uh, focus on education. Um, we, we almost feel like every moment we're with the women is a, is a learning uh, moment. And, um, and we have found over the 24 years that we've been in existence that these interventions in and of, you know, the loan themselves are not sufficient. You've got to, to, to really um, empower, them. well, we don't empower them, they empower themselves. We just give them the opportunity and we help them, we say to them, we help them open the doors they thought they were closed forever. And, um, and that's, you know, that's what, uh, and, you know, talking about what Katie and Dale were talking about, we actually collaborate with a lot of people because what we feel is, what we bring to the table is that we, we probably do what's the most expensive, which is to get the women. You know, that's, that's our number one expense. But they come every two weeks to our centers, and which, by the way, for them, it's also a, a social space and which is safe. And um, it, since they come every two weeks, there's the, the moment to intervene. You know, so so we, for example, a lot of our women are, are victims of domestic violence. We uh, do ourselves don't provide them with, you know, training. We bring people in the community who are already focusing on domestic violence to give them uh, the lessons. The same thing we do with, uh, we, we uh, do with uh, Habitat uh, for Humanity. We actually use their services to help our women. We give them the loan, but they, they help them um, do home improvement loans. So I want to encourage all of you to please tweet questions at CGIU and include the hashtag, hashtag CGIU. Um, but admittedly, before we move to your questions, I'm going to exercise my prerogative as the moderator and pick up on what uh, Bill was talking about, sort of the ways in which, as was Katie, the ways in which sort of technology has really disrupted um, the traditional model of um, foundations, philanthropy, social entrepreneurship, NGOs broadly, um, both by enabling more people to have more options and more outlets to engage, whether it be sort of in the social sector or kind of to put pressure on the private sector or the public sector, um, but also to expedite the learning around what's already happening, whether it be um, learning from Grameen Bank. I'm sure it's much easier now to learn about the Grameen model than it was in the early 1990s when Pro Muher um, brought it to Bolivia, or in the early 1980s when my mother brought it to Arkansas when she created an agriculture micro lending program in Arkansas in the early 1980s and brought Mohammed Yunus to Arkansas. Um, so clearly it's much easier for each of you to access different models that are already working at least somewhere um, and also to find potential partners for collaboration, for scale. So could you each talk about the ways in which technology has disrupted or has not yet disrupted, but you hope it will disrupt your work, Dale? Uh, <clears throat> that's a, a very good question. I think, as we all know, uh, technology has so much to offer to improve lives and uh, living conditions of people. But uh, technology is created by people. It should not be a replacement of one-on-one one -on -one conversation or reaching out to people who, 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 who need someone around. Uh, the example of Burundi, we, we, we do not have technology yet. And um, w what do we do in Burundi? Do we abandon a country because they have no access to the technology? What was working before in uh, human society was uh, through conversation even at a home, having a conversation with family members. And that is th something that I believe uh, is a kind of uh, dying, unfortunately, uh, because uh, uh, people do not have, uh, uh, they're spending a lot of time on iPhone and uh, text messaging and uh, calling or emailing, as opposed to reaching out to someone and shake hands and say, how are you? 
So that, that has a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of value. So I think combining technology and improving the uh, uh, lives of people and talking to people in medicine, uh, physicians are spending more time on filling out forms and the computers than they are spending on seeing patients. And uh, uh, who is going to suffer? It's the patients, it's the people we talk about that are going to help who are going to suffer even more when we think that time, 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 we're improving, we're running with time, but what is the quality of the work that we are doing and who are we as a human being versus the tools that we use? So I think there is, a, uh, there is a room for uh, improvement, uh, figuring out uh, these uh, uh, technologies that we use, um, who are using them, human beings, and uh, they should not replace uh, people. So I think that uh, uh, we, we need to, uh, to work uh, understanding that we are dealing with the, with, the, with the human beings. There's another issue that, uh, if I may, that uh, you raised about scaling up and uh, talk about partnership and the collaboration. And all the problems that uh, some of the, the, the founders of NGOs and other projects that have been facing, the whole idea and notion of innovation, which goes with the technology as well. I, I do believe uh, most, if not all, organizations and projects um, are created with the best intention to serve. But how is that done is, is the key. We, we face a lot of problems that, uh, for example, scaling up. Uh, how do you scale when you just started an organization, a project you are trying to learn the environment? How do you do that overnight when you are in the thickness of a forest, meaning problems? And don't run a hundred meters in a second because you are juggling trying to figure out how do I get there from here in this thickness of the forest. And uh, there's a, someone who is running on a beautiful um, football field. You are not going to do that at the same time. And it's not because someone who is going slowly is doing the wrong thing. It's just the conditions that that person is dealing with. And then there is a pressure from the donor community. Replicate, scale, and all that. That pressure, I think, is one of the biggest problems for people who are doing a lot of work. Instead of uh, jumping in and help and support so that uh, we can uh, help as many people as we can, uh, we spend so much time trying to figure out how do I please someone? and then your mission and your vision is kind of neglected, there's hardly anything you're going to do. So I think these are uh, issues that we are confronting with and those who think about collaboration, which is exactly what it should be, is to figure out how do I jump in, how do I support someone who has great ideas that work and I'm so passionate with. So I think this is the uh, things that we really need to highly encourage everyone who is thinking, what am I going to do tomorrow, or how am I struggling with this? Learn, learn from everyone. Do not reinvent the wheels. And whatever you do, do it in spirit of humility and gratitude. Um, and, and Katie, what do you see either in your own direct work or, or through BridgeSpan, and what sort of technology has disrupted or hasn't in how you think about partnerships or any of the other work that you focus on? Well, it's a great question, and I'm going to follow Deo's lead a little bit. I, I also lead our research on organizational learning, and, and we did a piece last year on making learning stick. And it really does take a combination of technology, so technology can help you get the idea out there, but then people-to-people -people interaction for application. And so whenever you are launching a new idea, if it is a technology-based idea, building in you know, the people-to-people -people piece, which can also be enabled by technology. So, so NINGS, there's a you know, variety of ways people can, can congregate virtually, as I'm sure you're aware of, um, that helps. But that, that people can ask a question and get an answer and adapt the idea to their situation, super important to create that space. 
Um, and so if I, if I apply it to, I'll apply it to a couple examples. One, let's go back to say the Khan Academy. I mean, they have done a great job of getting the, the how-to out there, um, but a lot of getting kids to really transform the way they think and do things relies on them being able to go back to their classroom and talk to their teacher about the things that they didn't understand. So if we don't make sure we have great teaching and learning in every classroom, um, the technology is not going to solve um, the problems. You've got to have both the people and the technology. If I look at One Hen, um, One Hen Inc., which is a financial literacy organization, we think of educators as our clients. I mean, we are equipping them with resources to inspire kids to financial responsibility, a personal initiative, global awareness, and giving back. So really getting a different vision of, of, of success, if you will, and a, and a chance to build businesses at a young age with small loans. And um, again, you know, the, the resources are all online, and because they are, we've got 100 countries, teachers in 100 countries downloading them, but, but without the teacher, you know, we wouldn't be getting the transformation with the kids. So I think that's really important to keep that balance in mind between technology. And also, have a broad definition of technology. Um, it doesn't have to mean it's on a computer. Um, so, so Jumpstart, which is a terrific organization working in early ed, one of their technologies, after they work with pre-K kids on um, early literacy um, uh, you know, efforts, is that they read the book to each other. So they will take a kid's book that they're reading, helping, you know, hoping that children will get a message, and at the end they debrief every session by reading to each other and having each of the, um, each of the in-class assistants critique each other on how well they're getting their message across. And so that's, that's the people side of their thing. And, it, and that's a technology. I mean, it's an approach, it's a technology, but it's very much a people-based technology. And, and Bill, the same question to you. What do you see kind of ha technology having disrupted and what hasn't it disrupted yet in the work of Ashoka and your fellows? Well, the most powerful form of disruption is when we change how we work together as humans. That's what drives the technology and it's back and forth. So when humans crossed the mouth of the Red Sea 50,000 years ago, our biggest group was 100 to 150. That was all we could manage. And now we have two countries over a billion. We have the World Wide Web. So we've made a tremendous progress. But up to now, change has been always there, but really slow and almost invisible from the point of view of a life. And so we organized around efficiency and repetition and bigger and bigger groups. I think the assembly line, the law firm, those are only about 100 years old. We're now at the moment where that whole world of efficiency and repetition is collapsing. And we have a huge opportunity, and I think that's what this conversation is about. How do we all contribute to building the architecture of a world where we can work together in dramatically better ways? So the underlying historical force is the rate of change since 1700, and we can measure it, has been going up exponentially. That means it's going really fast now. And one consequence is that the demand for repetition is going away. And now not just physical repetition, but intellectual repetition. Um, Alibaba, a competitor of yours in China, the, uh, it's the Chinese Amazon. They just launched uh, small loans. Uh, they've put out about $3 billion. They have the best repayment rate. Total staff, 200. Uh, three years ago, LIDAR did away with 85% of what field archaeologists do. We're going to have story after story like that. So the lives that people today think they can live, a repetitive job, aren't going to be there. The 15-year-old today isn't going to have that opportunity. So these are just very deeply profound changes. The other side of that curve is the curve of opportunity of contributing to change making. So I don't think it's a conflict between contributing to change and recognizing, as every story here has, that you've got to learn from everyone else. That's the strength of this new world. We're all connected. We can learn from another, one another. We can come together in constantly changing teams of teams. This is so much more powerful than anything that's gone before. It's really more like the human brain as versus some sort of mechanical object. 
And so that's our challenge. And everyone here, thank you, because you're at the frontier of this. You also have the enormous privilege that you'll never be afraid. You always, please give me a problem. I know what to do, how to get together with other people. But there's something to keep in mind, and this is our responsibility. Most people don't have that gift. And as the world changes faster and faster, it is terrifying. So our job, I submit, is how do we help make sure that everyone is a change maker and a collaborative change maker? Thank you. Rosario, the same question. Well, we act, I have three examples. Uh, actually, for us, technology is an enabler. That's the way we look at it. Uh, and for our clients to actually, there are more people with cell phones in Latin America than uh, who have access to financial services or health services. So it's a powerful tool. We um, have, a, the first one is uh, internally. We have 2,000 employees and we have been trying um, both for our clients and our employees. Big problem, health problem we have is obesity and um, and all that it comes with it, which is all these chronic diseases, which are terrible for poor people because they are expensive, like diabetes and hypertension. So we've encouraged, we're encouraging people to do exercise and to eat healthy and to drink water. And we have a Facebook page where we call it Pro Salud, for health. And people post, uh, our employees, uh, our 2,000 employees post every Saturday and Sunday some physical activity or healthy habit. And it's been, we started it two months ago and it's hugely popular. Uh, and it enables people in Argentina to talk to people in Bolivia. Um, so it's, it's again, it's a virtual community. So it's, it's still, the human element is, is there. The other one is that we are trying to get, um, uh, encourage our clients to save. And there's this software program being developed in Colombia. Uh, well, they actually already are piloting it and we're thinking of using it to remind people, you know, nudge them and remind them. And he was telling me that they actually, with a pilot, the women are actually sent them Christmas messages, you know, Christmas cards. So they thought it was a human being behind this. And it's obviously, obviously not. And we're trying to use that, those texts, uh, both for savings, but also for health, to remind people to take their medication, et cetera. And the third one is we have, um, we made a commitment at CGI last year um, on between us, uh, the Mayo Clinic and Sesame Street. And the Mayo Clinic is actually helping us train some of our, uh, our, our health staff on things that are a little bit beyond what uh, they do. And they've uh, given us tablets, I, actually iPads for all of the health staff, and, that, and they communicate on, you know, online uh, and can ask any question or, or uh, you know, uh, for help with a diagnostic. So I am a, a strong believer in technology, but I agree with Dale that it is not a substitute for building that relationship one-on-one. -on -one. And I'm very grateful to um, Rosario and Pro Mujer because um, of their partnership with Sesame Street, I got to meet a Muppet <laughs> at CGI last year. And so I thank you again for that <laughs> new opportunity. Um, we're now gonna turn to questions from Twitter and the audience. The first comes from Rugged Communications. Are for-profit businesses a more sustainable and scalable model for doing good? Please, Katie. Yeah, I mean, we would say if, uh, industry pl is, is certainly one platform and for-profit models are, um, you know, in, in many ways a beautiful platform because you can scale because if people want to buy it. You know, you don't have to go through policy tunnels or things like that. If people buy it, it's going to scale. Um, but it, it probably isn't adapted to every um, kind of need. So there'll be some there'll be some needs that um, will never at, certainly at the level that they exist right now will never be able to be packaged and set up as a cost effective product. Um, so you don't you need both, but it's it's definitely and what's interesting I don't know many of you have heard of Echoing Green, which is a startup funder 
um, in the social entrepreneurship space, and they've watched their applications move over the last um, five years from being largely nonprofit ventures to now being tilted toward either for-profit or hybrid. So people are definitely taking advantage of that, um, but it, it's not the only it's not the only platform. Any other comments, Bill or Rosario? Well, I, I think we're going to end up not with business and not with nonprofits, a phrase that I hate. How would you like to be called a non-bordello? I mean, really, it doesn't help. Uh, we're going to end up with this fluid team where everyone is working together. We, we've got to figure out how to do that and tear down the financial and legal barriers. Uh, we're not going to have businesses that are focused on shareholder value, and we're not going to have citizen groups alone. One of the huge opportunities is to tear down these walls. Every wall you tear down, you're opening up the field for this fluid communication collaboration. So we've actually done that for a number of industries just to demonstrate. So in India, 24.8 million missing housing units for informal sector workers in the city. Why? Because you buy vegetables in the morning, you sell them all day, you make a profit, but you don't have any paperwork. So how can you get a mortgage? And who are you? And you need a 200, 280 square foot house. Um, well, the builders don't do that. So you have market failure. You have big citizen groups, very competent, trusts, much lower cost, but they're lousy at real estate development. They have no access to mortgages. So you tear those walls down and you create a new system a hybrid system. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden, the citizen groups do the marketing, lending judgments, technical assistance collection, and they get paid for that, which is a new source of revenue completely separate from the traditional ones. The builders build, the finance companies finance. Well, there are eight new finance companies that have come in, some big ones such as Macquarie and Deutsche Bank are now looking at this. Uh, this is a $340 billion market failure that's now working in 10 cities in India. And obviously, you know, there's another 700 million people waiting to come into the cities and there are other countries, and you could imagine how that principle applies more broadly. So tearing down walls is a really good thing. And the business, social, profit, nonprofit, dad wall. I, I agree with Bill. I, I think that we like to talk about ourselves as a social enterprise because obviously we don't give shareholders back, you know, we don't have shareholders, but we, from the beginning, Promujer always felt that anything we do has to be sustainable. Uh, and so it's very entrenched in the organization and I think that uh, this di division between non-for-profit and for-profit, I agree with you, I think it's blurring faster and faster um, where, you know, uh, corporations are, are doing some really good stuff, you know, like Unilever uh, has been doing in, in, in India. And I think that um, non-for-profits, you know, the, the social sector is also learning a lot from corporates uh, in terms of, of how to uh, reach more people and, you know, be less, um, you know, more cost effective uh, and actually treat uh, the beneficiaries as clients, not as beneficiaries. But can I just say, Rosario, that uh, be that as it may, I think in your field, microfinance, there's been a really important role for organizations that didn't have the burden of shareholder expectations proving the market. So microfinance now, I mean, they're big banks working in microfinance, but I don't think they would have jumped in if um, an organization, a social enterprise that didn't have shareholder pressure but for, and that, so I think that's a really interesting way you can break down walls just to say where do we prove the market and then where do we let industry come uh, in? Absolutely. I think that the innovation comes from the social sector much more than from the corporate sector. I would also say you know, to not underestimate, um, for those of you in the auditorium, you know, the power that each of you have, not only as consumers but as potential employees. I mean, there is a reason why Unilever and Procter & Gamble McDonald's, Coca-Cola, all of these big Fortune 500 companies are increasingly having their corporate social responsibility not be an appendage, but being embedded in 
both the ethos, but also the practice of their company. So there's a reason why Coca-Cola has said it will go water neutral by 2020, as well as clearly helping the Gates Foundation, the Clinton Foundation, and others solve the proverbial last mile challenge of ensuring that vaccines or other health commodities can reach the last mile to where they really need to be in the communities that need them the most in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, um, and Southeast Asia, because Coca-Cola is really just a logistics company masquerading as a beverage company um, as they sell in 21 million points of sale every day around the world. Um, but ultimately, they're in the business of making drinks. And so they were increasingly hearing from their employees, their blue collar employees, their white collar employees, well, what are we going to do to give back in a way that's really congruent with our business? And so Coca-Cola decided they would go water neutral, that for every bit of water that they use to make Coca-Cola, they would recycle or clean an equal amount of water. That decision really came from their employee base. And so for many of you who will at least spend some time as not all of us on this stage, but many of us on this stage did spend time in the private sector, um, don't underestimate the power that you have to influence the company practice of wherever you might be working. The next question, I think this is really for each of our panelists. What's your favorite story about failure that was ultimately a teaching moment? I think this is a great question because I think this is something that really the for-profit sector, um, and I agree, we should have different language, Bill, because we would never have it, you know, not bordello. I love that idea. That's going to just stay with me. Um, but, you know, particularly in the tech sector, in Silicon Valley, failure is not shied away from. It's not always celebrated, but it certainly isn't sort of a crimson letter in the way in which it is too commonly in other arenas, particularly sort of the social sector. So I think this is a great moment for each of you to provide a teachable moment for our students and sort of where did failure help you or your organizations learn something along the way? Dale? Uh, I, think, I think really failure is when you give up on what you believe in because you are facing a lot of problems. Um, so maybe not failure, maybe just a, a hurdle or a setback. Uh, uh, maybe. So uh, I personally, uh, being the founder of uh, Village Earthworks in a, in a country where uh, hardly anything really seems to be to work, uh, I started working with uh, local community members who many of them were dying and suffering from uh, uh, poor health. And the children who have no education. It was very, very complicated to figure out. Organizing them was much easier because they knew they needed the kind of help that we're talking about. But how do we do that was the key. And who do you bring in? was a key. I didn't know many people. I ended up bringing some of my friends because they, are, they were the ones I knew. But did they have the skills that we needed to make sure that our work was going forward? They did not. So I ended up uh, getting in trouble with my friends and uh, that taught me something. Who do you get in and who do you ask and who where, uh, locally or outside. So key is really what I learned uh, from, uh, from uh, my struggles was uh, actually to talk to those who have the right knowledge and information and uh, combine with my knowledge knowing the environment and work together and communicate in all honesty understand that we have a daunting task ahead of us and working in one of the most grueling conditions, but through that understanding combined with the right skills, we had so much fun doing what we had planned to do and, um, and that, that took me so much time. Well, Bridgeman's actually in the process right now of, of really thinking deeply and um, engaging in a conversation around, um, we don't call it failure, but the shortfall between 
the social enterprises that have made absolutely the most progress against a given issue and the chasm between that and getting to a solution. And so if you take almost any um, you know, issue such as talent flows into education, so Teach for America, amazing jobs, biggest employer now of, of Ivy League graduates. Um, and yet, if you look at the need for uh, talent still in disadvantaged schools, it just pales by comparison to the number of, of teachers that are being deployed. Um, youth Unemployment, uh, Year Up is a great organization. They are now, they've gone from zero to 10 sites in 10 years, and they're fielding 2,000 um, uh, disconnected youth into jobs through an office and mentoring program. There's 6.7 dis, you know, million disconnected youth. So this big chasm, which um, is, is, you know, the, the big challenge is calling for now um, approaches that don't scale organizations, but, you know, truly scale impact through transformational means. So it's, it's taking your secret sauce, unbundling it, and giving it away. It's using technology to leverage if you're an organization. So how can you put what you have online so that lots of people can access it? It's looking at how do you strengthen fields. So we've, we've actually, I mean, if you're interested, we have a, um, a, uh, an article and a conversation starting on bridgespan.org on uh, nine different pathways that we're looking at, but all of them tee off the point, the, the fact that, you know, even our very best efforts don't get us close to the solution at this point. Bill? When I saw this question, I said, oh, God. Um, th this is Phoenix, and I remembered uh, about 10 years ago, the McKinsey partners were here, and I uh, was addressing them, and it's the last, it's the only time I've told this story before. This was so close to the edge of disaster that it was quite scary. I was about three months into my very junior associateship at McKinsey, just out of law school, and uh, New York City was about to go under financially, couldn't borrow, needed to raise a lot of taxes really quickly. So I was, since I didn't go to business school, this was just for me, and I was set to work to design taxes, the recycling incentive tax, the leaded gasoline tax, and the tar and nicotine tax, um, which added a nickel to a pack of cigarettes if it was high tar and nicotine, which did two very good things. One, it either meant they were less profitable, or there was a big and obvious warning that this is a particularly dangerous pack of cigarettes. Uh, and that led to Paul Mole Miles and Marlboro Lights and one out of eight people in the city shifting brands within six months. So you can imagine how the tobacco industry felt about this, since their only real value is uh, brand loyalty. Um, so two weeks into designing this, I got a call from the mayor's office what are you designing? The tobacco industry is calling. So I had to go to a meeting at City Hall, and all these senior people, um, and uh, an executive VP from a very large tobacco company. And to cut it short, they were uh, not telling the truth. So what to do? So I said very politely, well, I've been talking to some of your science people, and they say this. One of the deputy mayors got the point and said, you know, it's not really a good thing to intentionally mislead the public decision-making process. So the meeting didn't end in a very friendly note. A few hours later, I returned to the McKinsey office and just sitting down, in comes this guy who is twice my weight, at least twice my age, and has authority written all over his face. Are you Drayton? Yes. What do you think this is, a Nader office? And the conversation did not improve from that point onward. Um, so I went to see the partner I was working for, total radio silence for two weeks while I was doing everything possible to make sure that this tax couldn't possibly not be supported. Then I got invited to lunch at the Racket Club, which is a very established institution on Park Avenue where I'd never been before with various senior partners and the president of this tobacco company and his executive VP who had been at this meeting, and someone by the name of Marvin Bauer, whom you've probably heard of. I had not heard of him. This is my being out of it again. He is God. He was the person who really built the firm. So you can imagine my anxiety about this lunch. So, soup, main course, dessert, coffee is served, and they're talking about their time at Yale together. What? 
Okay, well, I haven't been decapitated yet. Then Marvin turned to the president of the tobacco company and said, um, I understand that you're not, you have some concerns with what we're doing for New York City, so tell me, and he did. By then the coffee is over. And Marvin turned to the president and said, we serve 40% of the top 500 companies in America. And no one has ever questioned our professionalism, which I immediately after learned was Marvin's most important word. Therefore, we can no longer serve you, and we won't. At the end of lunch, another rather chilly occasion as various partners' bonuses went flying out the window because this was a very big client. Now, the reason this story was so important is I was a bit player here, but Marvin was doing what was critical to McKinsey being the great institution he built. Its competitive advantage is ethical fiber. And I learned from that event and others that if you ever let intellectual or personal or any form of corruption get started, it metastasizes quickly. And so this goes to Dio's point at the beginning. The human qualities are still fundamental. In fact, they're more fundamental. When everyone is powerful, everyone can solve problems and things are moving really fast, it is critical for everyone to have mastered ethics in a new way. You have to be really good, not just that I feel your pain empathy, that's what elephants can do as well, but cognitive empathy to guide you because the rules cover less and less the faster things move. So you're gonna hurt people, you're gonna disrupt groups if you don't have that skill. These are very human skills and we have to make sure that everyone has them. If anyone doesn't have that skill, they're gonna be marginalized and ditto their group. And that's happening all over the world at the moment. So one of the four criteria for fellows and staff is ethical fiber. And I just, that experience was one of those moments where you really learned. Patricia? Uh, great. Um, we had um, uh, our health services in Nicaragua, this was about three or four years ago, where really the donor money was drying up and we had to think about what do we do? You know, this, this, we can't just shut it down. And so we decided that we needed to change our model to make it with a, with a goal of making it sustainable um, in three years or four years. And uh, we started, um, you know, piloting it, and we made it compulsory, you know, so the women had to, um, to pay a, a small amount, but they had, all had to pay. And they went up in arms. They said, you know, you are all about giving us the tools and making us strong, and now you're treating us like children. And so we had to actually stop it you know, and sort of come up with a different thing very quickly um, where it was elective, you know, and as you know from our own issues here in this country, you know, if you, if you, if it's elective, you, it's skewed because, you know, some people get sick and some others don't get sick. And so, um, but it was a teaching moment that, you know, again, to not think of them as beneficiaries because to think of them as people who have their likes, what they value, what they don't value, um, and for me it was a teaching moment. I think that's great. I think, um, please. Um, focused on, on who it is that you're actually trying to empower and to do what, um, and with kind of the underneath um, respect for dignity, I think is hugely important. Um, our last question, uh, quickly. Uh, is from Change Agent, a terrific Twitter handler. Um, what can big data and the skills to use it do to help in scaling what works? Yeah, Katie, yeah, please. I'd be happy to take that. We actually did an exercise last year with Harvard Business Review, um, creating an insight center on um, scaling social impact. And one month of it was dedicated to data and technology and how can you use that. And what we found was four, four specific ways. One is being an enabler. 
So something you want to do. And frankly, also enabling you and creating organizations, if that is the right answer. There is so much backbone available, you know, free online now to do all of the, you know, sort of back office functions that you need for an organization that, that it, you can enable the very creation of the organization. Another is for advocacy, so really building a movement. And I think um, a lot of times, you know, when you think mission first, you may not need an organization. You may not just need voice, and you may need a lot of voices. And technology is, um, is a great way. Big data can, and, and technology can help you get to that. Um, and a third way is really um, in evaluating what you've done and seeing whether it really works. And it's so important to measure, not just to prove something, but to learn, you know, to the points you've both made. And, and so making sure that you plug into whatever data you can collect. And as an, a junior organization, uh, you know, an, an Incuit organization, you may just be able to do some pre and post testing and be gathering data that way. If you're very mature, you may be able to do randomized controlled trials. But, but making sure you constantly are measuring to learn and adapt and improve, super important. And then I would say the last way is to just keep your ear to the ground and understand trends. So if you think of do something.org, which is a, an organization that works with youth and gets them involved in various service projects, they are constantly looking at their data to understand what's the next thing that might engage youth. Um, what is the way to communicate with them? I, I, I had a great discussion with one of their um, data scientists saying that, you know, we were sending out emails trying to engage youth, and when we sent out a text, we engaged so many more. So very simple things like that. But data can be, you know, the trend spotter. It can be the way you, you garner voices that you need. It can, can enable you, and it can also be the very way that you learn because it allows you to measure what's happening and see patterns. Anyone else want to comment on that? Uh, the Alibaba example I gave earlier, that's how it works. If they just see that Deo is buying shaving cream every Tuesday morning, they say, oh, regular guy, I can make a loan. And then the algorithm keeps adjusting. And of course, they have so many cases. It's something so much better than anything we could do. So it's, it, but there are areas that it doesn't work. So in health research, which is something we've been talking about, you've got the patent and the article. And so the data isn't shared. And so actually one of the fellows, Steve Friend in Seattle, is working to tear that down. And there are now seven universities here that are collaborating. Uh, there are so many, so many needs for people to spot where the system isn't working and go at it. Well, last night, um, one of the themes in the panel was courage. And clearly, I think each of our panelists, as is true of each one of you, has demonstrated remarkable courage already in their work and their lives. Um, I think another theme that we've heard today, which is courage is compliment, is humility. To have humility to ask what has already been proven to work, what hasn't been proven to work, who are natural partners, who maybe are not natural partners, as Deo talked about, um, and what is our ultimate metric of success? Is it starting a new organization or is it impact? And then should we be joining a movement, uh, shepherding a movement or leading a movement? Um, I can't wait to see what each one of our panelists will do kind of in their continued work. Similarly, as I can't wait to see what each one of you will do with your commitments and beyond. Um, please give all of our panelists a big round of applause and thank you to each of you.